If you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, we are beginning a new sermon series, which is really just section four of a really a four-part sermon series that we've been working through in the book of Genesis over the last 18 months or so. Uh, If you look at the book of Genesis, there's really four sections, and we uh, looked at the first section, which is uh, creation through the Tower of Babel, and then we looked at the life of Abraham, the first patriarch, where God called him to go to a place that he uh, would show him, and Abraham, by faith, walked into that place and uh, took up residence in that place and had children in that place. And then we looked at uh, the next two patriarchs, which are Isaac and Jacob, and how through Jacob the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be birthed and are going to take root in that place. And God's going to do a tremendous thing in that. And today we begin the fourth section, which is the life of Joseph. Out of all four sections, more is written about the life of Joseph than any of the others. And so this is a significant uh, figure in the Old Testament. Uh, When you look at the life of Joseph, what you look at is a model of integrity. Uh, Somebody who walked with character. Uh, Perhaps he and Daniel in the Old Testament are really the only two characters that we read their narrative, we read the stories about them, and we really find nothing wrong. We really find nothing of significant failure in their life. They they were, there were men who who faced temptation and withstood it. There were men who faced uh, difficult challenges and yet remained faithful. Unlike so many of the other characters, even important characters, even people of great faith like Abraham, we saw his failures. Isaac, we saw his failures. King David, we saw his failures. Moses couldn't even enter the promised land because of his failures. And so as we read the life of Joseph, we're going to see a life that's not perfect. He was not Jesus. He was not sinless. But boy, he was a model of integrity. Uh, Another thing that we're going to see as we walk through the life of Joseph, not only is his character and his integrity, but we're going to see glimpses and foreshadowings of Jesus. I'm going to try and point those out throughout the course of this sermon series. There's, there's probably 30 or 35 of them that we're going to make mention of each Sunday. Not 35 every Sunday, but three or four every Sunday as we walk through the text and as the text lends itself to speaking about those. I'm not going to write those in the notes every week, but if you want to have like a sheet of paper on the side or another page in your notebook or whatever you take notes in, where you just every week that you're here, just kind of write one down. And I believe by the time we finish finish this series at the end of the summer, you'll have 20 to 40 um, ways that you can look at the life of Joseph and see glimpses of Jesus. That's what the Old Testament does. It, It is pointing us towards the Messiah. It is talking already about how God is going to redeem a lost and sinful world. And we see little glimpses in different people. And there are certainly a lot in the life of Joseph. With, with, uh, with that in mind, let's read chapter 37, verses 1 through 11. I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. This is probably one of those stories that you may be familiar with. If you grew up at all in Sunday school uh, or in Bible study as a kid or vacation Bible school, you've probably heard the story of the coat of many colors. Maybe you've even seen the musical they've written about it. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this story has come to take place, and it's a very popular story. Ironically, there's only just a couple of verses given to the coat, but yet we talk about it quite a bit. We're going to see that this morning. Verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the son, excuse me, he was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and, took, uh, and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams 
and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, it's true and it's a great picture of your goodness towards us and your grace towards us that you are at work even in situations and in circumstances that we can't fully understand. And you're doing that not only in the life of Jacob and Joseph and his brothers, but you're doing that in our lives today. That you are working all around us. Father, help us to take our eyes off of ourselves. Help us to take our eyes off of the frustrations and the jealousy and the, the, the social media posts of other people where we think they're just doing great and our life is miserable. Father, help us to put our eyes on you. Reminding us that you are good. Reminding us that you care about us. Reminding us that you have a plan for our lives and that you're at work all around us. May you give us eyes to see how we can join you in that work. Father, I pray that as we walk through these texts over these next few months of the life of Joseph, that we will, as men and women, as students, desire to have a life and heart of integrity and character, that our lives and our words would match up with what we believe, that the Scripture would inform how we are to think and how we are to speak and how we are to act. Even when temptation and trial, trials come, Father, would you give us backbone? Would you give us the steadfast love of your word and of your truth? And then, Father, as we walk through this text, may we see the beauty of Christ. May we see how Joseph is just a a picture, a foreshadowing of a greater one who is to come. As good as Joseph was and as upright and outstanding as he was in so many ways, he was nothing compared to Jesus. And so, Father, may we ultimately not desire just to learn from Joseph, but may we desire to emulate and follow Christ. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. And I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The great pastor James Montgomery Boyce said this about Joseph. He said, Joseph was loved and hated, favored and abused, tempted and trusted, exalted and abased, Yet at no point in the 110-year life of Joseph did he ever seem to get his eyes off of God, to cease to trust him. Adversity did not harden his character and prosperity did not ruin him. He was the same in private as he was in public. He was truly a great man. We see this as we watch movies about him and we'll listen to musicals about him. He has certainly captivated the hearts and minds of even people today. And my prayer is that he will captivate our heart and mind as we turn our affection and attention to the one that he foreshadows in Christ. As we look at these short 11 verses, there's a a lot to unpack. But what Moses is trying to do as he writes this narrative of the life of Joseph is he's setting up this friction. He's setting up this frustration that his brothers have with him. And we're going to see that repeated over these first 11 verses. You probably already noticed as I read that multiple times in this text, it says his brothers hated him. His brothers despised him. And this hatred seems to grow with every action that Joseph takes. Joseph does something, his brothers hate him. Joseph does something else, his brothers hate him even more. Joseph has a dream, his brothers hate him even more. And so this animosity and this frustration and this friction is growing between Joseph and his brothers. And ultimately, we will see that this culminates in their actions. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the first thing I want us to see is this picture of favoritism. Jacob's favoritism caused friction. Jacob's favoritism caused friction friction. I don't know if you've ever experienced favoritism in your life. Maybe you've had a boss that had somebody in the office they liked a whole lot better than you. And every time there was money for a raise, they seemed to get it. Every time there was a promotion open, they seemed to get it. Every time there was a meeting where everybody had done something wrong, they seemed to get singled out as the one person who did something right. And you always get the the short end of the stick. And if you've ever been on that side, you understand how that frustration and that friction begins to grow. It may 
not even be that that person is done anything wrong or, or that they're attempting or that they're kissing, uh, kissing the boss or, or, you know, trying to work their way up. It may just be they're just doing a good job, but the boss has signal, sig, uh, signified them or signaled them, singled them out for accolades. And, and this frustration rises when there, we, when there appears to be a, a favorite in the crowd. We see this right off the bat in verse 1 and, and following. We'll go with me there. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings. If you have missed the first couple of sections of the book of Genesis, you can certainly go back and read. But just to give you a brief catch up, Abraham was called by God to go to a place where he did not know. He went and followed God there. There he had uh, children. And uh, one of those children was Isaac. And Isaac uh, was... Uh, this promised son that God had promised Abraham that he would give even in his old age. And so Isaac then had Jacob and Jacob had Joseph and Joseph had 11 other brothers and a sister. And so there were 12 of them and they were known as the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jacob is sojourning in the land. This land is called Canaan. It's the land that God had given to Abraham and had promised to the people of God, the, the Israelites from for that day and forever. And so they're there wandering in the land. They've settled in the land. And now we're learning about this son, Joseph, who the really the rest of the book of Genesis is going to be about. It says there in verse two, these are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old, um, we have some 17-year-olds, I'm sure, in this room. Um, this is a beautiful age, but it's also an age which you're trying to figure out some things. And so Jacob, uh, excuse me, Joseph was out in the field pasturing or shepherding the flock with his older brothers. He was, the boy, he was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha. These were his half-brothers. If you remember, uh, uh, Jacob was not an extremely faithful man. And so he had two wives and two servants in which he had children with. And Joseph was the son of his favorite wife, Rachel. Uh, a little bit of favoritism we'll talk about there in a minute. But Joseph has these two half-brothers um, that he's out in the field with of his father's wives. And then we read this line at the end of verse 2. It says, And Joseph brought a bad report to them to their father. Now, this is a little bit ambiguous in the Hebrew language. We are not exactly sure if this report is an accurate report in that Joseph is in charge of these other brothers and that's causing some resentment. And he's just coming back to his dad saying, hey, our, my brothers aren't working hard or my brothers aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing or, or hey, what are we going to do about this because they're not uh, following the directions that you've given, Jacob. And, and I'm just reporting back honestly what's happening here. It could be that. It could certainly be that. It could also be more of a he's tattling on them. He's trying to get them in trouble. He's trying to set himself up a little bit higher than them. The, the language does not imply either way. And so as you read commentaries on this, you're going to see about half of them side one side, half of them side to the other side. But there's this bad report. We, we don't know the motive necessarily behind it, but we do know that it wasn't painting his brothers in a good light. Either way. And this caused friction. This caused frustration. This caused anger of them towards their brother Jacob. And so this friction begins to take root. As I mentioned earlier, this is the picture that Moses is trying to paint for us. Because when we get later on in the text and we see that, that his brothers sell him into slavery, we're going to understand why this anger, why this frustration led them to take such an action. And so this is the text that's kind of painting that picture. And so we begin to see right off the bat this favoritism, this friction that's happening between Joseph and his brothers. And that leads us to the second idea, which is that Jacob's affection caused resentment. Jacob had a deep love for Joseph. This favoritism is playing itself out now in the way that he treats Joseph. Look at verse 3. Now Israel, Israel is Jacob's other name. If you remember, God changed his name to Israel. And as we read the text throughout Genesis, sometimes the name Jacob will be used. Sometimes the name Israel will be used. In this case, it says Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. 
he loved him more than the others. Now, this is a problem. This is that favoritism being exposed throughout the entire family. It says, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. Now, this is um, a, a robe that it would have been long. It would have been long-sleeved. It would have been very ornate. Uh, the phrasing in the Hebrew is, is kind of vague. This is not a word that's used very often. It's also a word where um, t- typically uh, people who would wear these coats were signified as great leaders or chosen out of a group or had great wealth. And it's thought that his giving of this robe to Joseph signified that he was going to be the chosen son as the leader of the family. He was going to be the one of the family who was going to receive the greatest inheritance, the one who was going to get the double portion, the birthright. And so we see this playing itself out. Remember, uh, if you were with us a couple weeks ago when we were back in Genesis uh, earlier, we saw that some of his brothers uh, had lost their status. The sons of Leah were disqualified, Simeon and Levi, because they were cruel to the people in Shechem, and then Reuben for his fornication in Genesis 35. And so they were out. They were no longer going to be part of the inheritance because of their behavior. So this kind of signified then that J- uh, Jacob was choosing Joseph to step into that role. And this coat of many colors or this robe of many colors was a, a public way of bestowing his birthright upon Joseph. And of course, as you can imagine, this made his brothers even more irate. That he would get such a valuable and beautiful gift. But more than the coat itself is what it signified. It signified this is the chosen one. This is the one that's going to lead the family. This is the one that's going to get the attention. He is the one of of which I love the most, which is what we see there in verse 3. Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. And then we read in verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, favoritism was a generational sin in this family already. We see generational sin even today. We learn things from our parents. We learn things from our grandparents. Things are passed down in our family, some of which are good and some of which are not. Your kids, your grandkids are watching you. And some of the things that they're learning are hopefully good. If you're here with them this morning, they're learning, hey, you know what? Church and the gathering together with the saints is important. And one of the reasons why we talk about coming together in, ch- in church as families so often is because this is, a, is something that kids learn from their parents. When we value church, our kids most often, not always, but most often learn to value it as well. The things we value are things that they value. Most of the time, kids learn even their sports allegiance from their parents. If your dad grew up as a Cowboys fan or an Indians fan or a Reds fan or a Browns fan or whatever, a Bengals fan, oftentimes the kid will grow up that way. Why? Because as a little kid, they're watching games with their dad. They're watching games with their family. So they, they take on some of the attributes and some of the things that their parents like as uh, they do that. If your dad played sports with you as a kid, maybe that's something that you like to do. If your dad or mother was musical, maybe that's something that you pass on to your kids. But we do that spiritually too. They watch our lives. They watch our actions. They watch our words and they emulate those. And they say, well, if God is important to my parents, maybe he ought to be important to me. If God's not important to my parents, maybe he's not important to me. One of the things that we we clearly see is that favoritism was a problem in this family. So not only can we pass on our good things, if our kids see us practicing bad habits, they'll say, well, that must be okay. That's the way that we do it. That's how it ought to work. And so they'll pick up this, these bad things as well. And certainly we see favoritism picked up in this family as a problem. We go back and we read back in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28. We see that uh, Joseph's grandfather had a problem with favoritism. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you have a father loving one son more and a wife loving the other son more. And then we will read in Genesis 33, verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming. This is the story we read about a few months ago, where Esau and Jacob are are reconciling. 
And Jacob is fearful that Esau is not going to reconcile, that he's going to destroy him. And so he sets up his family in order of, of really how he wants them to be killed in his mind. He's like, hey, we'll put the ones that we like the least out front. So when the, the slaughter comes, they'll get slaughtered first. And then the ones we don't like the second, we'll put them second. And the well, ones we really love, we'll keep at the back. And maybe we'll be able to save them. And that's what happens here. It says, so he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front. Then Leah with her children. And Rachel and Joseph last of all. And so Joseph is the favored. We see this already back several chapters back just in the way that Jacob's already treating Rachel and Joseph. And so it says that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah uh, in, in her offspring. And it's likely that he showed Joseph favoritism because he was the son of Rachel, which was the wife that he truly loved. Now also Rachel had since died and so I'm sure he was close. Jacob was thinking about that, that uh, relationship and, and so Joseph and Jacob's affection for one another continued to grow. But we see this resentment becoming, to, becoming uh, a, a significant portion of the story. They hated him, verse 4 says, and they could not even speak peacefully to him. Now let's talk a little bit about this hatred. I mean, have you ever really hated a person? Like somebody did something so egregious, so mean, so spiteful that, man, it's been really, really hard to move past it. I talk to people often. People come to my office. People stop me in the hall and like, I'm really struggling with what so-and-so did to me. I will never forgive them. I will never forget. I will never be able to move on. And I hear that, for, unfortunately, a lot of times about situations in church where people will come up and say, when I was a kid, this happened to me. Somebody betrayed my trust. Somebody mistreated me. Somebody abused me. Somebody was hurtful to me. Or as an adult, some pastor did X, Y, Z, or some Sunday school teacher did this, or I had a friend at church who stabbed me in the back, or whatever the awful situation is and certainly they are they are, that happen and those are real and, and and hurtful experiences but like in life in the church and everywhere else when we harbor such hatred and we are, don't allow the grace of God and the forgiveness of God to begin to soften our heart towards people guess what happens we become bitter we become angry, angry at people, angry at God, unable to walk in faith, unable to trust people. And our whole life begins to be summed up by our hatred or our, or our offense to what somebody's done to us. And when we hold such hatred and such a grudge in our heart, we're unable to love other people and we're unable to receive love from other people who may desire to really and sincerely desire the best for us. When we hold grudges, we're ended up hurting ourselves, not the person who's done us wrong. So many times I talk to people and they're like, so-and-so hurt me 30 years ago. I'm like, well, so-and-so has already forgotten about that. You know who's still walking in that hatred? You. You're the one that's still harboring that pain. They've moved on. They've totally forgotten about it. Right or wrong, they've moved on. They're not, they're not walking in the misery. You're walking in the misery. And so part of walking with God is allowing God to do that work of cleansing in our hearts. Now we realize that life is hard. Life is difficult. People are going to do us wrong sometimes. Every one of us has been done wrong by somebody at some point. But we've never been done wrong by God. And God is able and willing and is cleansing us and working on us and changing us and the faster and quicker we can let that anger and hatred go towards somebody the more we'll experience the joy and love of Christ in our lives it's not going to be easy because people have hurt us really bad at times but I believe that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world that greater is the spirit of Christ in your life to bring about healing and hope and forgiveness so that we no longer have to look backwards at that event, at that situation, at that person. Because when we're looking backwards all the time, we won't see what God is doing in front of us. And if we don't see what God's doing in front of us, we'll miss the blessings that he wants to do in our lives today. But so many people, they just spend their whole life looking back that they can't see what God's doing in the moment. And I just want to encourage you, don't be like that. 
Ask God to do a work. It may take some time. It may not be that you just walk out of here today and go like, well, I've been holding that grudge for 50 years and now I just, whatever. It may take some time, but allow God to work on your heart and in your life because the more we harbor hatred, the more we're going to struggle. We're going to see that in the life of, of Jacob's brothers. They're going to continue to hate him and hate him and hate him. And then they're going to take action. And that action is going to have severe and dire consequences. And we don't want to continue to fall into that trap of continuing to, to walk down the wrong direction. And so it says there that they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Because they had allowed the, the affection of Jacob to cause resentment in their lives. The third thing I want us to see in the text is that Jacob's past caused hesitation. His past caused hesitation. We all have things in our past, good things and bad things, that cause us to pause. When we see something happening in our current life that reminds us of something that's happened in our past, sometimes it causes us to pause. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. Sometimes we've had an experience that's negative that we think, mm, I don't want to do that again. I see how the potential that this situation could be like that situation, and I don't necessarily want to go down that road. Other times, it's a good thing. Hey, I remember when God did that thing in the past, and I see a door opening that he may do something like that again, and I want to be open and ready for that. So we allow sometimes our, our past experiences to, to either open doors or close doors. And, and I, what we're going to see here in Jacob's life is that He's experienced some things in his past, both positive and, and negative, that are going to cause him some hesitation as Joseph shares some dreams with him. Look at me at verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. You see the, the repetition, hate, hate, hate. Anything Jacob does that's positive, they just hate him even more because it just uh, exacerbates the love that his father has for him and the, the fact that he's different from the, the rest of them. And so he has this dream and he told his brothers. Now, I don't know exactly how that went down. I wasn't there, but I, I have a sibling and I have kids and I watch how they interact. I, I just got to imagine that Joseph was like, hey guys, you want to hear my dream? And they were probably like, not really, not really at all. And he's like, that's all right, I'm going to tell you anyway, right? Because that's what siblings do. Uh, it was about you guys, don't you want to hear it? And so he goes into this dream, verse 6. He says, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Isn't that great news, guys? One day, you'll all bow down to me. How's that sound? And as you can imagine, it did not go over well, as would not that conversation, if you have multiple kids, go over well in your house uh, for one of them telling the other ones that they were going to be better than them or boss over them or the leader over them or that everybody was going to submit to them. Now, this is obviously true. This is a dream that was given from the Lord, and so it's going to absolutely come into play. But his brothers did not like it. Uh, as you can imagine. Remember, they've already hated him, right? Verse 5, and then we get to verse 8, and his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? They're saying, you, you have this dream where we bow down to you. You cannot be serious. You're really going to really tell us this? This is really what you're dreaming about at night? So they hated him even more. This is like the third time. It's like, how much can they more hate, right? I mean, it seems like when you get to 100%, you're at 100%. But man, they found a way to crank that thing up from 100 to 110 to 115 to 150. They're hating him even more for his dreams and for his words. But guess what? He's not done yet. Verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream. Now, later on in the text, uh, in, uh, later on in Genesis, we're going to see that when, uh, Dan, uh, excuse me, when Joseph has dreams for Pharaoh, Pharaoh says to him these interesting words. He says, because you have had this dream twice, it is surely from the Lord. And so here we see a second dream that Joseph dreams. And he says that he told it to his brothers. And he says, behold, I've dreamed another dream. As if the first one wasn't bad enough for you guys. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now, who could that be? Well, the sun and the moon were his parents. 
and the 11 stars were his brothers. And so he's saying, not only will you brothers bow down to me, but mom and dad will also bow down to me. Now, most of us as parents, we're all okay with the little sibling squabble, but most of us are not down with obeying our kids, right? That's really not how it's supposed to work. Kids are supposed to obey their parents. Parents are supposed to be the, in charge. Children are supposed to submit to the parents. But what God is doing is he's raising up Joseph for a, a, a special thing that he's going to do and that he's going to use in such a way. But even Jacob is not really down with that, which is kind of interesting because Jacob's very life is that paradox, Jacob's very life is the paradox of the one who is younger being over the one who is older. If we go back to Genesis chapter 25, this is the story of Jacob's birth. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Here's what the Lord said. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Jacob's entire life is based on this principle that Esau would submit to him, that he would be greater than his older brother. And so now we get here this next generation and Jacob is saying, wait a minute, I don't know that I'm good with Joseph being the one who is over me. It's interesting how our past sometimes has a little bit of of interesting uh, turns and twists in it. And this is causing a little bit of hesitation in Jacob's life. He's not really down with this. And so he says to his, uh, he says when he told this to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? So he rebukes him. But there's this little bit There's this little bit of what Joseph is saying to his dad that's resonating. It's resonating because of his past. It's resonating because of what's going on in his own heart. And it says, and his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. It's like, I don't like it. I'm going to correct you. But man, what if there's just a little bit of truth there? What if this is what God's going to do? I've seen him do it before. I've I've seen how he's moved in the past. What What if he does something again? So he's just keeping the door of faith on that cracked a little bit open. And I don't know what's going on in your past. As I mentioned before, man, maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've walked through difficult times. But let me encourage you in this. Would you keep the door of faith just a little bit cracked? Would you not close that thing all the way? Would you just leave a little bit of room so the light can get in? So that as God begins to work in your life, he'll begin to open that door a little bit more. A little bit more. Maybe you're far away from God right now. My prayer for you today is that you'll just leave the door cracked open. That you won't close it all the way on the things of God. But you'll let's say, God... I'm having struggles right now. God, I got a lot of doubts right now. God, I got a lot of fears right now. God, man, I've been hurt before. The church has hurt me. The pastor's hurt me. The, my Christian friends hurt me. My whatever. But man, I, I just want to keep the door of faith just a little bit open. to Give you room to work. And I think that's what, what Jacob was doing. He just said, he kept the saying in mind. And that's so important in our lives that we... We, we just hesitate just enough on closing that door all the way that we give God that little bit of room to work. Now, as we finish this text, there's several passages in this text, several things that ought to then remind us of Christ. And I really want to finish our time in the text by thinking about Jesus. Because as great as Joseph is and as high character and as high integrity as we're going to see his life, his life really just serves us in order to point to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who is living and active, the one who is doing a work. And so as we think about Jesus today, I want to just give you four. And again, mentioned earlier, you can just jot these down on the side. They're not going to be on the screen, but I'll just mention them slowly. You can write them down in your own words. First one is that we look at Joseph's name. Joseph, the name means to increase or add to. We see this back in Genesis 30, verse 22. 
Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So the name Joseph means to increase or add to, and it reminds us of what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 9, 7 about the Messiah when he says, of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end. Jesus has come to increase. He's come to add to. He says, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly, to increase it, to add to it, to make it better. And that's Joseph's very name, the one who adds to or increases. But interestingly enough, Joseph has another name, a name that's given to him by Pharaoh in Genesis 41, 45. And it says, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephanath Paneah, which means God speaks or God reveals. And God is certainly revealed. And Jesus is the revealer of the Father, is he not? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so as we look at Joseph, the one who reveals the, 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 the nature and character of God through these dreams, that's why Pharaoh calls him the revealer of God, we see that Jesus too is the revealer of God. Second thing we can see as we compare and we look at Joseph as a foreshadowing of Christ is that Joseph was a shepherd. Look at verse 2. We just looked at this earlier. He was 17 years old and he was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a shepherd. And who is Jesus? Jesus is the good shepherd. John chapter 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The, the third way that we can see is that Joseph was uniquely loved by his father. We saw that in verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And certainly, Jesus is uniquely loved by the father. At his baptism in Matthew 3, we see that immediately as he came up out of the water, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We know that uh, just as Joseph was probably designated by the coat of many colors as the one who would inherit the birthright, we know that Jesus was the chosen son of the Father. He was the one who was despised and rejected by men, but he is the one who has set us free as the one who gives us the inheritance. And then lastly, Joseph was despised by his own. His own brothers rejected him. His own brothers hated him. What do we learn about the Messiah? Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one with whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We hated him. Like, like the brothers hated Joseph, we hated Jesus. Think about that. Every time Jesus did something, a miracle, healed somebody who was sick, cast out a demon, what did the scribes and Pharisees do? They hated him even more. Every time Joseph would show up with a dream, every time Joseph would speak truth, what happened? They hated him even more. Ultimately, we're going to see that what? They sold him into slavery. They cast him off as dead just as we saw last week, the scribes and the Pharisees cast Jesus off to death. They hated him so much, they wanted him dead and gone. Joseph was despised by his own. In fact, we read that Jesus was also despised in John 1, 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, Jesus said, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was despised. And yet, Jesus is the one who will save us from our sin. And we're not there yet, but guess who is the one that will save the brothers? It's Joseph. He will ascend to leadership in, in Egypt he will provide for their needs. He will rescue them from certain death, just as Jesus has rescued us from death. He's rescued us from the death that comes from sin. And so I ask you this morning, have you been rescued by Jesus? 
Just as Joseph's brothers will be rescued by him, are you rescued by Jesus? Have you been saved from your sin? Have you been snatched out of the claws of death and into eternal life through faith in Jesus? If not, that is his desire for you today. I pray that one of two things will happen. Either one, you'll take your next step of faith, which is keeping that door cracked open so that the spirit of the living God can be at work, that you can begin to see how he desires to be in relationship with you. Or second, maybe he's kicked that door wide open this morning. And he's saying to you this morning, do you know me? Do you trust me? Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Savior? And if not, then I want to invite you this morning. Would you call upon his name? Would you trust in him? He is good. He loves you. He cares about you. He cares about the pain of your past. And he has a bright future for you. But you have to call upon his name. You have to place your faith and trust in him. He is worthy.